yesterday we were uh, talking about a charged particle in a homogeneous magnetic field and I said I will take the field along the z direction. So, today we will continue with that problem of a charged particle of mass m subject to a uniform magnetic field. And as I mentioned to you yesterday, uh, the eigenfunctions would involve the eigenfunctions uh, uh, of the oscillator type of the linear harmonic oscillator type and also um, a part of the eigenfunction would correspond to that of a free particle and we will see how exactly that comes. So, uh, first of all the magnetic field B itself can be written in terms of the uh, vector potential as del cross A, <coughs> A is the vector potential. And I said that if I did a gauge transformation where A changed to A plus grad chi, it simply does not change B. So, this is an example of a gauge transformation. In fact, the full set of transformations are best understood if we look at the electric field as well, uh, because the electric field can be written as minus gradient of the scalar potential phi <coughs> minus 1 by c delta a by delta t. And therefore, it is not enough if a alone made a transformation. In order to keep the electric field unchanged under the gauge transformation, phi changes correspondingly to phi prime, which is phi minus 1 by c delta chi by delta t, the same chi that appears there in the A equation. So, these two define the gauge transformation. The gauge transformation is not a space time transformation. As you can see, the transformation is made on the vector and the scalar potential, not on space time. So, it is an example of an internal symmetry transformation, something that does not change space time itself, but only changes other quantities, in this case a and phi. Now, it is very clear that if a changed in this manner and phi changed in that manner, e is left unchanged because under the gauge transformation e goes to minus gradient of phi minus 1 by c delta chi by delta t and minus 1 by c delta by delta t a has changed to a plus grad chi. It is evident that here minus grad phi minus 1 by c delta a by delta t continues to be and this term 1 by c gradient of delta chi by delta t comes with a plus sign and here 1 by c gradient of delta chi by delta t comes with a minus sign. Therefore, they cancel out and the electric field is left unchanged under the gauge transformation even like the magnetic field is left unchanged under the gauge transformation. Chi is called a gauge parameter. And it is clear that any chi will do the trick. There are uh, uh, no particular conditions that I have used on chi except that it is a scalar and therefore, I have an infinite choice of chi's that I could use. The only feature that I need to remember is this, that if A changes by gradient of a given specific chi, phi should change in this manner using the same chi. Now, under a gauge transformation therefore, the vector and scalar potentials change leaving the electric and magnetic fields invariant. <coughs> so, several choice of 
uh, a's and phi's can be used. Let me look at one of them. So, a could well be minus half y b. I have selected b to be along the z axis. Uh, it is a constant here, not a function of space time. So, it is a homogeneous magnetic field and I have defined that direction to be the z axis. So, a could be this. Now, it is uh, pretty clear that if I look at del cross a, that is simply going to be E x in general of course, um, delta A z by delta y minus delta A y by delta z plus E y times <coughs> delta A x by delta z minus delta A z by delta x plus E z times <coughs> delta a y by delta x minus delta a x by delta y. Now, with this choice of the vector potential, since a z is 0, this does not contribute. A y is not a function of z. So, this does not contribute. So, there is no component along the x axis. Similarly, look at this. A x does not have z in it and therefore, this does not contribute and a z is 0. So, there is no component along the y direction. However, delta a y by delta x. So, the only non-zero term, non-vanishing term is along the z direction and I have uh, half b and then from here I have another half b. So, that just gives me a b e z. So, this is a possible choice of a and in fact, subsequently during this lecture, I will work with this choice of A. But this is not the only choice. Clearly, I can have another uh, set of components for A. I could choose A <coughs> to be minus y b 0 0. Now, if I did this, it is clear that del cross A is again B E Z can be easily checked out. So, it is possible to choose this set or that set for A, but then these two would differ by a gauge transformation. As you can see, uh, originally A was minus half y B and that has gone to minus y B and therefore, grad chi uh, the x component would be delta chi by delta x. Delta by delta chi by delta x is minus half y b. Similarly, half x b that was a y went to 0. Therefore, delta chi by delta y is minus half x b and a z was 0 anyway. So, it is possible that I can choose chi to be minus half x y b. That is a possibility for chi, because surely delta chi by delta x gives me that and delta chi by delta y gives me minus half x b. So, these two sets that I have selected for A are related by a gauge transformation. It is also possible to choose A x to be 0, A y to be non-zero and A z to be 0. Um, any one of these is a possible choice of gauge. So, when I say that I have selected, I have chosen a gauge, it means that I have already selected my components A x, A y, A z and those are the components with which I am going to work. The freedom that I have is called gauge freedom, the freedom to choose any one of these infinite sets, each one related to the other by a suitable gauge transformation. In other words, by a specific choice of the parameter chi. So, in, in general, um, 
one works with any choice of gauge. A popular gauge is the Landau gauge. where two components are 0 and the third component is non-zero. So, uh, that is a possible choice, but as I have said I would work with this choice for A in the latter half of my lecture. But now let us get back with this uh, introduction to the charged particle in a homogeneous magnetic field. And as I pointed out in the last lecture, there is a minimal coupling prescription P goes to P minus E A by C <coughs> and this object I refer to it as script P capital P. The Hamiltonian itself therefore, was P squared by 2 m. Originally it was little p squared by 2 m and that has now become script P squared by 2 m. So, p x is p x minus e a x by c and so on, p y is p y minus e a y by c, p z is little p z minus e a z by c. The point is the following, when I do a p squared, it obviously involves p x squared, p y squared and p z squared. In terms of the linear momentum of the particle, it would involve the square of the linear momentum of the particle and also the square of the vector potential. So, I have little p squared and little a squared in the Hamiltonian when I expand it. There are no cubic terms. <coughs> of course, there are cross terms. There would be a p dot a kind of term and an a dot p term and so on. I understand however, that I am dealing with a quadratic form. I am dealing with terms which only involve quadratics in p and a or cross terms p dot a and so on. And therefore, that rings a bell. Is it possible to somehow choose variables such that this problem gets mapped on to the linear harmonic oscillator problem? Because I know that I have dealt with the quadratic form of the Hamiltonian there. And since I know the energy eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions, for that problem. Would it be possible to use that in understanding what the energy spectrum of uh, the charged particle in a magnetic field is? So, that is the question that we will address here. In order to do that, I first of all have to uh, find appropriate canonically conjugate variables. You will recall that in the harmonic oscillator problem, we had uh, the commutator between x and p, p sub x if you wish, because it was a linear harmonic oscillator. The commutator between x and p was i h cross. So, my first job here is to identify two such objects pertaining to this problem, where the commutator is i h cross. Then, even as I combined x and p, I had x plus i p barring some constants and x minus i p, it is a Hermitian conjugate. Uh, those were the ladder operators. So, here too if I can find such ladder operators, my job is done. So, my first um, problem here is to find out various commutators. So, in that spirit, I first wish to find the commutator of p x with a y. Now, that is an easy job. I work in the position representation, because A x, A y etcetera are functions of x, y and z. So, uh, P x A y psi is minus I h cross delta by delta x of A y psi. Right now, I do not have a choice for A y. I work with a general A minus of A y minus i h cross delta by delta x psi. So, this object is minus i h cross delta a y by delta x times psi minus i h cross a y 
delta psi by delta x plus i h cross a y delta psi by delta x. So, this is the same as minus i h cross delta a y by delta x psi and therefore, the commutator p x a y is minus i h cross delta a y by delta x. Clearly, this is a cyclic relation in the sense that if I take p y commutator with a z, I will have minus i h cross delta a z by delta y. Similarly, p z commutator with a x and so on. So, this is the first thing that I have. Now, my aim since the Hamiltonian is in terms of capital P's, the next step is to use this to find out the commutator of capital P x with capital P y. Now, this would mean the commutator of P x minus E A x by C with P y minus E A y by C. Surely, P x and P y commute with each other and I already know the commutator between P x and A y even as I know the commutator between P y and A x. So, this quantity is simply going to be minus E by C commutator of P x with A y <coughs> plus E by C commutator of P y with A x because the commutator of A x with P y is minus the commutator of P y with A x. So, I can now substitute and find out what this is. I therefore, have commutator of P x with P y is minus E by C minus I h cross delta A y by delta x that is the first term plus E by C minus I h cross delta A x by delta y. So, that is the same as I h cross <coughs> E by C. I have delta A y by delta x minus delta A x by delta y and that is B z. As I said right now I have not assumed it to be along the z direction the magnetic field to be along the z direction but p x p y is i h cross e by c b z uh, which means that it should be possible for me to scale things here. I should be able to decide I should be able to give appropriate uh, values for uh, uh, scale p x and p y in such a fashion that I simply get i h cross as my answer and that is what I would try to do now because if I have root of uh, c by e let us now say that b is b e z. Therefore, I will just call this b instead of b z. So, if I take root of c by e b p x commutator with root of c by e b p y. that is simply going to be C by E b commutator of P x with P y which I know is this object. There is an identity operator there, but by now we know that we do not have to put it in, but it is there and therefore, this is the commutation relation that I have uh, which is analogous to the commutator of x with P. So, I have root of C by E b P x root of c by e b p y is i h cross identity. So, my hunch was right it should be possible now to define ladder operators appropriate ladder operators I will call them b and b dagger as linear combinations of p x and p y which satisfy the algebra commutator b with b dagger is identity. So, I go about it this way as in the case of the uh, linear harmonic oscillator, I define a B which is 1 by root of uh, 
2 h cross. <coughs> root of c by e b p x plus i root of c by e b p y. Therefore, b dagger is 1 by root of 2 h cross, the dagger of this the complex the Hermitian conjugate. Now, in the commutator b with b dagger, therefore, it is clear what is going to happen. So, the commutator of b with b dagger is simply identity, because uh, this will pull out an overall factor uh, in the commutator of b with b dagger, I get an overall factor 1 by 2 h cross. There is a commutator which is c by e b uh, root of c by e b p x with minus i root of c by e b p y. And I have got that commutator here, uh, that is an i h cross already with this minus i, it gives me a plus. Similarly, out here that gives me the same uh, value i h cross with a plus. And therefore, there is a 2 which cancels out with the 2 that comes out as the overall coefficient. It is a trivial matter to check that b b dagger is identity. And that is good news for me, because now all I have to do is find out b dagger b. So, if I expand b dagger b, it is 1 by 2 h cross <coughs> root of c by E b p x minus i root of c by E b p y, uh, these are all capital P's times root of c by E b p x plus i root of c by E b p y. That is 1 by 2 h cross. The first term is just c by E b p x squared and this times that gives me plus c by e b p y squared. Then I have cross terms. The first thing is plus i c by e b p x p y and the next one is minus i c by e b p y p x but that is clearly a commutator. I can write this as 1 by 2 h cross c by e b p x squared plus p y squared plus i commutator of root of c by e b p x with root of c by e b p y. I already know what that commutator is, we have got that here. Root of c by e b p x commutator with root of c by e b p y is merely i h cross. Therefore, I can substitute i h cross there. What do I get then? My final answer is quite simple. Let me write that here. So, I was trying to figure out what b dagger b was, and that is 1 by 2 h cross p x squared plus p y squared. There is an overall coefficient c by e b multiplying that and then I have plus i times i h cross which is minus h cross and therefore, c by 2 h cross e b p x squared plus p y squared. Suppose, I pull that out minus e b by c h cross minus e b h cross by c e 
equals b dagger b. I can do better. I can pull the 2 inside and multiply this by 2, uh, divide this by 2 and then I am through because I now see that b dagger b plus half times e b by h cross c is p x squared plus p y squared by 2 what I want is p x squared plus p y squared by 2 m and therefore, this is simply going to be e h cross by m c b dagger b plus half times e h cross by m c e and h cross went up there. So, e h cross by m c is p x squared plus p y squared by 2 m. And so, it is clear that this is of the harmonic oscillator form E h cross by m c there is a b of course, that is p x squared plus p y squared by 2 m. A part of the Hamiltonian has therefore, been written in terms of something analogous to the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, but remember that the total Hamiltonian was p x squared plus p y squared by 2 m plus p z squared by 2 m. But p z is little p z minus e a z by c, but since a z is 0 p z squared by 2 m is simply replaced by little p z squared by 2 m. You should remember that this is an operator it is not a number, this is a Hamiltonian, it is an operator p z squared by 2 m. But therefore, the Hamiltonian can be written in a very uh, easy form as b dagger b plus half times e h cross by m c b plus p z squared by 2 m. And this is an easy thing for me to handle, because I certainly know the eigenspectrum of uh, this part. <coughs> it is n plus half h cross omega, where n takes values instead of h cross omega. Now, I will write e h cross by m c b. This is n plus half e h cross by m c b. That is going to be the eigenvalue. For a given value of b, I have a set of discrete energy levels. Uh, each labeled by the values of n, n taking value 0, 1, 2, 3, etcetera. And this is precisely the Hamiltonian for a free particle and I know the solution for the uh, free particle Hamiltonian, I know the solution for the eigenstate of the free particle Hamiltonian. So, which is what I will now use, I have the following solution, the energy eigenvalue E n is n plus half e h cross by m c b n taking value 0, 1, 2, 3 etcetera plus the eigenvalue of the operator p z. First of all, this is a free particle Hamiltonian and therefore, uh, I have the number p which is the eigenvalue of the operator p z, p z acting on psi z is little p psi z and that little p is what figures here. Psi of z itself is a plane wave solution e to the i p z by h cross. So, the linear momentum of the particle is p, there is a plane wave solution it behaves like a free particle with a constant linear momentum along the z direction e to the i p z by h cross is the solution. And as far as psi x y is concerned that is the eigenfunction corresponding to this discrete spectrum, I know that the solutions are the harmonic oscillator solutions psi n. It is clear that psi 0 the lowest state 
will be an eigenstate of the operator B with eigenvalue 0, trivial eigenvalue 0 psi 0. Uh, this is like the ground state of the harmonic oscillator and therefore, I write B psi 0 is equal to 0. And then I create the various excited states by repeated application of B dagger. So, I repeatedly apply B dagger n times to psi 0 that gives me psi n and for the sake of normalization, I divide by root of n factorial. So, this is what I have. So, these are the Eigen uh, values and the Eigen functions can be given as uh, the Eigen functions are can be written out here, because we will do some work with the Eigen functions now. So, psi is psi of x y, which I call psi n <coughs> of x y, because it is in the x y plane. And along the z axis, I have e to the i p z by h cross. It is usual to normalize that uh, with a root 2 pi. Now, how come a plane wave solution like uh, say e to the i p x pick up a factor 1 by root 2 pi? Consider this. There is a simple way of understanding this. We know the following. This object is delta p minus p prime, but of course, I can always write this. Suppose, I were working from minus infinity to infinity. I can put in a complete set of states like this, because an integral over the allowed space d x ket x bra x is identity and that is what I have sandwiched here. And I know that this is uh, the wave function. So, this would have an e to the i p prime x and this would have an e to the minus i p x. I have written it in the uh, uh, x representation, but I can use a form of the delta function. This can be written in that following fashion. And then when I compare the two of them, it is clear that I need to put in a 1 by 2 pi on this side. And therefore, if I have an e to the i p prime minus p x, there should be a 1 by 2 pi, it is off by 1 by 2 pi. And uh, so, each of this say psi of x would be e to the i p x by root of 2 pi. So, that is how I get the root 2 pi there. So, that is one factor which could be put in, but quite apart from that, there is the whole business of normalizing e to the i p z by h cross, it is a plane wave solution. So, if you look at psi star psi, where psi is e to the i p z by h cross and z itself goes from minus infinity to infinity, you can see that this blows up. But plane wave solutions are extremely common in quantum mechanics. The free particle is the simplest example we can think of. So, normally in order to normalize a plane wave solution of this form e to the i p z by h cross, you take recourse to box normalization. In one dimension for instance, you imagine that the particle is really moving freely within a box. Uh, let us say psi z. So, the, the box goes from minus l by 2 to l by 2. In that case, if you started with e to the i p z by h cross by l to the power of half, it is clear that this is normalizable. If this is the wave function, start with some psi by l to the power of half integral minus l by 2 to l by 2 psi star psi dz or dx, 
whichever be the direction the axis on which the box is. Then you find that uh, if this cancels out if e to the i cancels with e to the minus i you are left with uh, a 1 by l because that is the way you normalized it and d x when integrated gives me an l and that gives me a 1. So, really it is common in the normalization in the box normalization to start for every dimension you divide by root l and therefore, in three dimensions the wave function is down by l to the 3 by 2. So, l to the minus 3 by 2 times the wave function is what you could use if you were doing an integration like this in three dimensions. So, this box of course, is uh, I have done it for one dimension otherwise x, y and z go from minus l by 2 to l by 2 and in each case you pick out an l to the minus half and therefore, the box normalization involves dividing by l to the half dividing by l to the half for each dimension that you look at. Then you do the problem <coughs> do the problem of a free particle inside that box finally, take the limit l going to infinity. And clearly, the limit of a function is not the same as the value of the function at that point and that is precisely how the box normalization is done in the case of a plane wave problem. But that is as far as the normalization is concerned the structure itself is this this as you will recall this part psi sub n of x comma y uh, would involve the uh, thermite polynomials. You, you will recall that the ground state of the harmonic oscillator was a Gaussian function. So, I would expect a Gaussian for psi 0 of x y I would expect a Gaussian function of x and y if n is 0. So, it is certainly worth looking at uh, what happens to the ground state psi 0 of x y. The energy eigenvalues of course, are n plus half E h cross b by m c. plus p squared by 2 m n taking value 0, 1, 2 etcetera and those are the energy eigenfunctions have to normalize it suitably. Now, let us look at a specific choice of a we have already said that b is along the z axis in other words I choose the direction of b to be the z axis and I wish to work with the, the choice so, I am going to choose a to be minus half y b half x b <coughs> 0 these are the components of a. Want to look at the ground state solution and look at the Gaussian form uh, get back the Gaussian form. So, I have b psi 0 of x y equals 0. even to begin with I realize the following since b is along the z axis <coughs> there should be a cylindrical symmetry in this problem. Even in the classical analog when we look at a charged particle moving in the presence of a homogeneous magnetic field it is helical motion and therefore, there is circular symmetry there are planes where there is a symmetry. So, I would expect to see that kind of symmetry in my solution. I now have to write down b which I already have b was defined as 1 by root of 2 h cross capital P x plus i p y and uh, that object was root of c by uh, E b p x plus i root of c by E b p y. So, this was my definition of b. Since this was the manner in which we had defined b, let us now recall that p x is little p x minus E a x by c and p y capital was little p y minus E a y by c and substitute for a x and a y accordingly and then 
you have b equals 1 by root of 2 h cross root of c by e b times p x minus e a x by c plus p y i times p y minus e a y by c. Substitute for p x as minus i h cross delta by delta x similarly for p y and use the values of a x and a y that we have selected. In other words, we are using a specific gauge now and therefore, b would simply be root of c by 2 h cross e b times minus i h cross delta by delta x minus e by c a x is minus half y b plus i times minus i h cross delta by delta y for p y minus e by c half x b for a y. So, this is what we have. This quantity is simply root of c by 2 h cross e b times minus i h cross delta by delta x <coughs> plus e y b by 2 c plus h cross delta by delta y minus i e x b by 2 c. So, this is what we have when we expand this. It is good to change variables and also absorb constants suitably. I define a constant lambda uh, alpha if you wish which is root of uh, E b by 2 h cross c. Now, if you did that, you define a variable zeta which is alpha x and eta which is alpha y. So, that I can get rid of unnecessary constants. So, you see the first term for instance uh, the x would be replaced by zeta by alpha and uh, I will have delta by delta zeta instead of delta by delta x and delta by delta eta instead of delta by delta y. With this replacement, it is a simple matter to rewrite this equation in terms of zeta and eta. So, in terms of the variables uh, zeta and eta, what do I get for the differential equation? The equation is simply that b acting on the ground state is 0, it is the annihilation operator on the ground state. So, I have apart from a minus i by 2 uh, delta by delta zeta plus zeta, if I recast the equation in terms of zeta and eta plus i times delta by delta eta plus eta, this acts on the wave function which is a function of zeta and eta now and I would like to do that in terms of a separation of variables. I will write the wave function of as f of zeta g of eta and then this operator acting on that wave function is 0. <coughs> so, I basically have delta by delta zeta plus zeta. f of zeta g of eta plus i delta by delta eta plus that is eta not zeta f of zeta g of eta equals 0. As we always do in separation of variables, <coughs> let me divide by f of zeta g of eta. So, basically I have g of eta by f of zeta g of eta delta by delta zeta plus zeta acting on f of zeta. I have pulled the g of eta outside because this is only an operator function of zeta and cannot act on g of eta. And similarly here 
I can write this in the following manner. Like I always do when I separate variables. So that just tells me that 1 by f of zeta delta by delta zeta plus zeta f of zeta plus i by g of eta delta by delta eta plus eta acting on g of eta equals 0. So, this is merely a function of zeta and this is going to give me a function of eta. And if this equation has to be true, this should be equal to some separation constant. <clears throat> I will call that lambda. So, this is lambda and this is minus lambda and therefore, they cancel out, which therefore means in terms of the separated equations. delta by delta zeta plus zeta minus lambda acting on f of zeta equals 0. That is my first equation. And similarly, delta by delta eta plus eta minus i lambda. There is an i there and I have to take care of that acting on g of eta equals 0. What is the solution? <clears throat> the solution is simple. Now, I have psi 0 of zeta eta. And I have written the 0 there to show that we are discussing the ground state wave function. These are Gaussians. So, the solution is e to the minus half zeta squared from there. But that is not all. There is a lambda and that is going to give me an e to the minus lambda zeta. e to the minus half eta squared e to the minus i lambda eta. That is the solution. Apart from constants, overall constants, normalization, let us not worry about that. You have this, essentially you have this. So, basically I am not worrying about overall multiplicative constants and so on. But this is what I have and this can be written as e to the minus half zeta squared e to the minus half eta squared e to the minus lambda zeta plus i eta. I will comment about this a little later, <coughs> but I can also write this if I complete squares and so on. Suppose I write lambda which in general can be complex. This is a, a well behaved function even if lambda is complex. So, if I write this as some zeta naught plus i eta naught, write it in terms of its real and imaginary parts, then this psi can be written also as e to the minus half zeta minus zeta naught the whole squared. It is a shifted Gaussian e to the minus half eta minus eta naught the whole squared and e to the i zeta naught eta plus eta naught zeta. I leave it to you as a simple exercise to put it in this form. So, I could think of it the solution could be written this way or that way and again I have not worried about normalization overall constants and so on and so forth. So, this is what I have. <coughs> now, a variety of comments can be made on the solution. First of all, since this is what comes out of the uh, the x y plane, because you will recall that zeta and eta were functions of x and y. It would essentially involve x minus x naught the whole squared 
and e to the minus half y minus y naught the whole square. Of course, as far as z is concerned, there is an e to the i p z by root 2 pi that, that stays. So, the full solution has apart from all these things, it also has an e to the i p z by root 2 pi which we have discussed earlier. So, now if you look at the x y plane, the solution only depends on the distance x minus x naught the whole squared that distance <coughs> from x naught comma y naught. So, there is a circular symmetry that you see in this problem. One would expect it because I know for instance that uh, once I map it on to the harmonic oscillator as far as the ground state is concerned uh, it is a Gaussian. This turns out to be shifted by x naught and y naught and uh, the x naught and y naught came because uh, the separation constant was written in terms of zeta naught and eta naught which were related to x naught and y naught. And then you see the circular symmetry in the x y plane uh, which is a sort of um, vestige if you wish or very consistent if you wish with the classical situation where in the presence of a magnetic field you have circular uh, trajectories. <coughs> so, that is one thing. An interesting observation is the following that if you look at this term here. this is an exponential series and so I can expand it in powers of uh, this exponential series can be expanded in powers of zeta plus i eta to the power of s. There are an infinite number of terms and they will involve zeta plus i eta to the power of s where s takes value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. And those are all linearly independent objects. I could choose any one of them in the solution and therefore, I have an infinite degeneracy even in the ground state. So, if I take a circular uh, uh, section in the x y plane, there is an infinite degeneracy because for any value of s 0 or 1 or 2, I have one solution and all those solutions are linearly independent the series is expanded in terms of this. These are called the Landau levels that means <coughs> that while it looks like the harmonic oscillator uh, solution in the x y plane even the ground state is infinitely degenerate and uh, the levels are called the Landau levels. To summarize, we have very many interesting features in this problem of the charged particle in the presence of a homogeneous magnetic field. <coughs> there is a discrete spectrum, the eigenvalue is n, uh, n taking value 0, 1, 2, 3 apart from the plus half and the constants uh, that are analogous to h cross omega in this problem. But then there is also a continuum in the z axis because p takes uh, the momentum takes a constant value and any value at that it is a plane wave solution. Infinite degeneracy even in the ground state a circular symmetry which is reminiscent of what one sees in the presence of a magnetic field in a classical context. And these are the take home lessons because the spectrum is continuous along the z axis and discrete in the x y plane.